We have a special guest right now. It's uh, Hermela Aragawi. She's an independent Ethiopian-American journalist and a part-time community organizer who was a reporter and anchor with CBS Los Angeles for three years and before that worked for Al Jazeera America, Current TV, and the Young Turks, among other media outlets. She's also helped launch the hashtag No More as part of a global grassroots movement created to defend Africa and the African expats from the U.S. imperialist exploitation. Hermela, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jimmy. Nice to see you again. Great to see you. So now I just want to give people a little bit of background and then you can take it away and explain everything. So I just want to show people we're talking about Ethiopia. That's where it is right now. Over here, isn't that? Now that's Yemen, right? Over here and then Saudi Arabia, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then so here's a little closer. So there's here's Ethiopia. There's Somalia. There's Yemen, right? There's Kenya to our president, uh, Sudan. Okay, so I'll give you just a thumbnail sketch. This is from Wikipedia, so it might not, probably won't, isn't accurate, so she can correct it. Uh, the Tigray War, it's called. There's a war happening in Ethiopia, and it's an ongoing civil war that began on November 3rd, 2020, in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. The local Tigray Defense Forces, the TDF, are fighting the Ethiopian National Defense Force, the ENDF, the, uh, they're fighting a bunch of people. Okay. All right. So, so t- and Tigray is in the north. It's the northernmost yeah. region of Ethiopia. Yeah. So it's so it's right here, right? Yep. It's right there. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's where the TPLF has taken root. So just tell, gone- so go ahead. Tell people what happened. So so this 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 is the part of Ethiopia that's being held by this rebel group, right? And there was uh, a civil war started. Why did the civil war start? It was a regime change operation. It's very, it's actually, I know when people hear Africa, like their heads sort of spin, but if you just really think about it as this being a regime change operation by the US and the TPLF are a uh, an ethno-fascist group that hail from that Northern region. Ethno-fascist meaning they think this one minority ethnicity of which I happen to be a part of should run all of Ethiopia and dominate the Horn of Africa, which is exactly what they've done from 1991 until 2018 when they were ousted out of power. So rather than sort of laying low and just you know taking the loss, they started the operation to get back into power which is what this entire conflict has been about. But it's been a hot mess. They have not been able to succeed. um, And that's why it's turned into this protracted war. So they started this war in November 2020 by attacking National Army Defense Forces in the largest army base in the country that was based in Tigray. And it did not work. It did not work because the Ethiopian government and the Eritrean government were ready because they know this entity. They were in power uh, for 27 years. And what did the U.S. and mainstream media do to cover the cover up the fact that this is what it was? They claimed genocide. So rather than owning that the Ethiopian and Eritrean government were fighting this group that attacked an army base, they said this is a genocide of all ethnic Tigrayans in the Tigray region. Again, my family hails from there. So let me just see if I get this straight. So <clears throat> these rebels who had power for 27 years lost power. Now they start a they attack a military installation right up here. Right. And that starts the Civil War. And the United States is on their side. Right. These, and the United States then starts putting out propaganda saying that uh, this the government while defending themselves against these terrorists, right, uh, is somehow committing a genocide. That's the story that was reported in the West, that instead of the Ethiopian government is fighting against these terrorists, that the story that was that uh, these the Ethiopian government is committing a genocide. That was a story? Yep. I knew you would get it. Yeah, that is a story. I mean, plain and simple. That is as, as, as cut and dry as it gets. And so you've seen that reported in the United States like that? Over and over again, I left my mainstream media job because I was so frustrated with how they kept repeating the lie, even when there was data that kept unfolding that 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 showed the opposite uh, being true. I worked for CBS, CBS Network were saying the same thing. ABC, uh, everybody uh, was saying that CNN, New York Times, they were all claiming this genocide. The Ethiopian government was trying to kill the 
all ethnic Tigrayans. Uh, they were trying to starve them out, uh, a, a humanitarian blockade. As you know, they, they take this humanitarian angle in mainstream media and the U.S. government as if they're the defenders of yes. ethnic Tigrayans, when really what they want is this group to come back into power. So what we all did as expats all over the world that have connections to Ethiopia and Eritrea and Africa is a year into the war, we said, you know what? No more of this bullshit. Like, like we see it. We see this disinformation campaign. It's dividing our communities in the diaspora. It's dividing people on the ground in the Horn of Africa. And it is fueling this war that has killed hundreds of thousands of people, not because the Ethiopian government is trying to take out ethnic Tigrayans, but because this terrorist group is pushing ethnic Tigrayans into this war in hopes of getting back into power for another 27 years. And so this is the this is called Tigray, this area right yes. here. OK. All right. And you're from there. From there. Both my parents, there, ethnic to grand. And so, you know, you knew at CBS when they were reporting this incorrectly, you knew they were. So you informed them at CBS that they were reporting it incorrectly. And what was the response? Well, um, it looks like you're doing activism is what they said. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm actually really frustrated with the fact that all of mainstream media is getting it wrong. So, you know, they were nice about it. I had a good experience at CBS as far as my, you know, uh, colleagues go. For three years, I was there. I did my job. It was all good. But in that moment, they said, well, we have to, you know, look into the and investigate. And I had to choose at that point. Am I going to stick in this space and watch this whole thing unfold while hundreds of thousands of people keep dying? Or am I as a mainstream media journalist and an ethnic to grant? So I have a very unique platform in that way. Am I going to actually use my voice to push back against this? And I just chose the latter. So you left. Did they ever do their investigation? We never really talked after that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you didn't try to have one of those moments on air, like, I'm going to tell the truth about what's happening in Ethiopia, and I don't care if I get fired. I was sticking to my job. Like, I know my limits. You know, I know my limits. There's no point in just causing a ruckus. For what? what? I could just go independent and do exactly what I'm doing. I mean, my following has, you know, ballooned, not because... I'm opportunistic, but because people are like, oh, thank God, because all of, you know, Ethiopia and expats all over the world and all of Eritreans and Somalians, by the way, who are also victims of this ethno fascist group for 27 years who divided the Horn of Africa down to ethnicity and all these different uh, divisive tools. Everybody was just like, thank God, an ethnic Tigrayan who has that mainstream media platform would actually, you know, come out and call the bullshit. So this is interesting. Uh, the Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abli, how do you say his name? Abi Ahmed. Abi Ahmed. He received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019. So that was the, so 2018, those, that government that was rep oppressive, right? Uh, they got, they, were they voted out? How did they get out of power? Yeah, it was, you know, it was a fortunate uh, set of events. First, I have to say, I think Trump being in power kind of, took the attention away from this uh, this region. In general, Democrats are the most damaging to this region. For whatever reason, they have chosen to be you know, best friends with TPLF and they'll do anything to keep them in power. Um, and so when Trump was around, they got a little bit of room to breathe and actually decide on their own destiny. So there was years of protests from 2012 to 2018, and then the parliament actually voted them out. This prime minister turned out to be a little savvier than they expected him to be. So it was all done fair um, and square. So they give him that prize. But then in January 2020, there was a tripartite alliance between Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia. That's when the U.S. was like, mm -mm, "This is the they're 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 getting together. They're 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 unified. They actually want to have a say in their own destiny." And then fast forward that same year, November election day, election day, the U.S. election day is when the TPLF attacked that army base overnight, starting this war. So they loved this guy, and uh, you know, as long as he wasn't unifying the horn but the second they realized oh this is somebody that is not going to be a puppet for us that's when they uh started the regime change operation so here's another wrinkle uh this is a bill in the senate of the united states april 28 2020 the director of the secretary of state to develop and submit to congress a strategy and implementation plan cutting 
outlining United States efforts to counter, get this, to counter the malign influence and activities of the Russian Federation and its proxies in Africa for uh, and for other purposes. So tell me the significance of this. So this kind of got slipped under uh, our radar, unfortunately. Um, this is really about attacking the expat voice, which has been incredibly successful in pushing back against that genocide rhetoric, which means it poked a hole in manufacturing consent, which would have allowed them to bring in at least UN peacekeepers or African Union peacekeepers, uh, which would have you know allowed them to manipulate what was going on in the area. So there's been a lot of targeting of uh, our accounts uh, on Twitter, they're essentially, uh, there's another section of that um, that I sent in where they talk about going after people that manipulate public opinions and voting preferences of African populations and diaspora or expat groups, including those in the United States. So let me walk it back to this last November when we all came together and said in a unified voice, no more. So we did that November 1st uh, around the anniversary of the war. A few days later, the results came in in the Virginia governor's race where the Ethiopian uh, uh, American population there had a huge role in kicking out Democrat Terry McAuliffe and voting in Youngkin. There was a actually a Washington Post article I sent in uh, with that headline. So all of a sudden they realized we're not playing, we're actually taking part um, in, in the politics. So hashtag no more starts to trend a few days later. Uh, Twitter safety under the guise of safety disables trends in Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and a whole bunch of African countries that were starting to use the hashtag. Um, and then we all took to the streets in a global day of rally again later in November. Um, and that 27 cities, millions of people all over the world. And that's when they started taking our accounts down. Our central account was Horn of Africa Hub. And then later, No More Hub gets taken down. And then Simon Tesfamariam, an Eritrean American organizer who was also executive director of New African Institute, his account goes down. New African Institute uh, account goes down. And a Twitter spokesperson is quoted in a VOA article saying, basically, like he called his account spam. Like that was the extent of which we got uh, uh, an answer. Nebu Asphalt, another Ethiopian American so, taken down. So this shows how we've talked about this on this show, how this social media companies are in bed with the intelligence state, right? Uh, with Absolutely. the uh, intelligence apparatus in the United States. And and they work together to censor people, right? To censor active activists. And uh, so that's what this is. So that's what they've been doing. So the, the hashtag no more. And what is it? What it was? How did you pick no more? What does that mean? No more what? You know, we were sort of going through ideas and some of it we were trying to say Ethiopia fact, whatever. And then we we're like, no, this is larger than that. This isn't about just what's happening to us. It's about the system in place that pushes disinformation, that then divides people, that then fuels a war. So when we saw that pattern as being global, so many other communities have gone through the same exact thing. We just went with no more. It just felt like organic. Um, just no more to this game that is being played that's actually costing lives on the ground. TPLF is, is encouraged and enabled by what the U.S. is doing to push these poor, innocent people into this war in hopes of this delusional regime change. Right before we went out to the streets in November, there were CNN was saying the, the rebels are almost in Addis. They're in the outskirts. They're about to take over Ethiopia. And then there's this video I sent you of these so-called, you know, Ethiopian representatives that were in Washington, D.C. with the presence of mainstream media uh, um, uh, giving them credibility, saying out loud, Jimmy, like only, I swear, if this was in an African country, it would be all over the headlines, saying out loud, we are going to dismantle the Ethiopian government by force or by diplomacy. And Reuters and New York Times were there acting like this was normal. So, there, of course, that's the first thing they do is they try to censor, uh, have... Well, here, let me let me go to this. So this is a, a tweet by, well, I'll show you who this guy is. Uh, he's uh, a former CAA, former State Department, former White House, still recovering. Okay, so 
This is what he tweeted out. My latest on what the U.S. needs to do to create leverage for itself to advance peace in Ethiopia. They all they know all the words to use. They know the right words. In short, diplomatic engagement and sharp admonishments to all sides has not worked. More civilians are at risk and all sides are preparing for more war. So he's saying that dip- diplomacy is not working. So I'm going to guess what he's going to advocate is war. Aiding the war effort and last, a U.S. strategy to push back on the massive disinformation campaign being led by official spokespeople. Rabid despor. How do you say that word? Aspera, expat agitators. That's rabid, right. Rabid expat agitators. Rabid yeah. expat. So people like you. So they're saying people That's like... Me. So people like you, someone from Ethiopia, an expat, that you you got to be silenced because you're spreading misinformation. And yeah. that's what so that's what they're doing. So they they're going after you on social media. Have they tried to discredit you yet? Um, you know, I'm like the only account. It's a little scary. I feel like they're just waiting for the uh, an opportune time. I think they're they're being methodical. Taking out Simon was huge. He was really monumental in this. Taking out Nebi was absolutely huge. It was actually three of us that came together and came up uh, with this hashtag along with so many other people working with us. So they took those two out and I'm kind of here by myself. Of course, we have, you know, the larger anti-war community as well, by the way. It's not just Ethiopians and Eritreans. At this point, Mali has said no more. Uganda has said no more. Zimbabwe has said no more. I mean, in general, Africa is sort of the bottom of the bottom when it comes to exploited people, when it comes to exploitation via imperialism. So for them, this is for the first time, Africans are crossing lines, nationality lines, ethnicity, um, uh, religion, and they're also partnering with anti-war allies and black folks here um, in the U.S., I mean, I would argue you've never seen anything like this. So for them, it is it is we are we are a liability to the the story that they're looking to tell in order to get their terrorist friends back into power. So the United States on the wrong side of another regime change war. And this one happens to be in Ethiopia. And what do they do? They do the same thing they always do. They uh, smear and silence and censor the people telling the truth about the illegal actions of the United States State Department, our CIA, our military and our allies around the world. So um, is there is there anything else I left we left out of this story you want to share? Yeah. So there's a couple other bills. Uh, There's a there's H.R. 6600 in the House and as well as uh, 3199 in the Senate that are similar to the other one that we brought up. They are uh, planning to sanction the Ethiopian government and the Eritrean government for fighting back against this terrorist uh, group, as well as expats. Like once again, when you see expats, I'm an American, we're Americans. We just so happen to have roots in Ethiopia. So when they go after Americans for saying, speaking the truth about something that has huge consequences on the ground, that is something that should alert all of us. I mean, I, Jimmy, I've been watching your show and it's so exciting because there's so many people that don't get it. And it's so frustrating. There are people that are in the mainstream media, people that you would otherwise expect to understand it and they don't get it. So when I saw we're watching your show, we're like, oh, my God, finally, like somebody can see the bigger picture, the global picture. So I am pleading to anyone who's watching your show to join uh, the No More Movement, which simply means whatever it is that you're talking about that fits this sort of formula, just add hashtag no more to it so we don't feel alone. Because the first people they're going to go after in this disinformation governor's board or whatever it is they're trying to do is going to be us because we don't, we're, we're, we're new. We're a new budding movement. You know, African expats have not been this engaged uh, in their stories uh, as we have with no more. So We just need to build a coalition. You know, I don't believe in single issue activism. I I wasn't an activist before this or an organizer before this. I think the thing that scares the U.S. war hawks the most is when people cross race, ethnicity, religion, political party or whatever uh, have you and actually come together on the larger issues. So that's really uh, the biggest thing that I would love for your audience to take away. This isn't just an African issue. It's it's a it's a formula. It's a formula that they apply all over the world. Ethiopia just happens to be at the center of it right now. It's a that it's definitely a formula they apply all over the world. 
And it's been that way for the entire history of this country. So it's not, this is not, nothing new. It just happens to be happening right now in Ethiopia. Well, uh, oh, real quick, Jimmy, sorry. Uh, the, the 3199 bill, actually, they, they updated it. So the head of WHO, World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adhanom, is a member of this terrorist group. Okay, is a member, leading member of the Tigray People's Liberation Front. And he has been using his platform as the head to advocate for this group. So he came to D.C. not that long ago, rubbing elbows elbows with uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and some other folks in Congress. He's pictured in that. And after he came, they added an element to the Senate bill adding anti-American sentiment as one of the things that they're going to go after Jesus. among those of us. It's it's insane. It's straight out of the McCarthy era. I mean, if I wasn't living in it, I would not believe it if somebody told me. So that's a huge element. I mean, he he's the first non-medical doctor to hold that position. He's completely unqualified to hold that position. We've all been screaming at the top of our lungs that he needs to be taken uh, down. The Ethiopian government has asked the UN to investigate what he's been doing. There are audio leaks that where the UN officials have said Tedros Adhanom, head of WHO, has been orchestrating humanitarian aid to go to these rebels as opposed to letting it do what it's supposed to do, which is go to civilians in this war. I didn't, uh, I knew that, that the, the, he wasn't a doctor, and that's so funny. No one, most people don't know that. Um, wow, I did that. that didn't, I, that's wow. That <laughs> I is, know, let's take a moment. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. There's a lot. I mean, people have no idea how corrupt our government is. They have a absolutely no idea how corrupt these international organizations are, like the WHO. Uh, what do you think the WHO gets their money? I'll give you three guesses. Uh, where do you think the FDA gets their money? I'll give you the same three guesses. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is an amazing story. Uh, so has anybody else, uh, has, have people been helping you amplify your message? You've been getting any traction? Yeah. I mean, we really have. Um, I think this platform is going to kind of uh, expand our reach a little bit. A lot of anti-war allies, Answer Coalition is really big and pushing for us. Gray Zone and all these different platforms that are actually independent and that get it. Uh, I've been on in spaces with Ben Norton, Breakthrough News. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other independent media. Like they get it. Like these spaces get it. And we go and we talk about it. And I think their audience has an understanding of what's going on um, in Ethiopia. It's just a matter of really putting it into the fold of the larger conversation we're seeing happening about disinformation as opposed to like assuming this is an Africa story. It's really not. It's all kind of tied together. Um, and it just so happens that people on the ground in Africa have the least voice, which is why we're so dangerous to the State Department's narrative. Do you think that Russiagate and the way it was covered in the United States it led to people like you being able to be censored now without a bat of an eye of polite society. And that's what my theory is, is that we wouldn't be having this war in the Ukraine if it wasn't for four years of Russiagate. Uh, all that did was lead us to this. Uh, so what do you think? Absolutely. People don't even have to think anymore. They just say you are what's what's the word that you're, you're a Russian propagandist. I mean, they don't have to even say what it is that you're actually doing or saying that's not true. We are actually scared to touch any issue with Russia because we already know that we have a target on us. So if we say something uh, in that story, it just feels like an obvious they're going to take down my account, which has 240,000 followers. It's kind of the anchor um, of this movement at this point. People in Addis Ababa, when they were at the capital of Ethiopia, when they were protesting with us in November, they had pictures of Putin because they were like, this guy's going to protect us because you guys keep killing us. You keep supporting this group that is killing us. So it's not because they want to be pro-Russia. And it's not because they they have any sort of feelings towards Putin. They just feel like the U.S. is helping kill the people in their land and putting all this pressure on the region. So absolutely, that's where it started. I wish I knew. I wish I had a better understanding back then. But so many of us have waken up to this whole disinformation game um, and how they're able to smear people uh, with just a, a, a call of a word without actually criticizing what it is that we're saying that's not true. So 
you used to work at the Young Turks when I was there. Uh, did, yeah. Have you reached out to them? Do they know about this story? I reached out to them a couple of times. Uh, but, I, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, I reached out to them some months back uh, a few times. Uh, you know, they said they'll look into it. But, you know, I've looked at the programming. I don't know that it would be a fit at this point. <laughs> I mean, personally, we're cool, you know, no, no, no issues. But in terms of the actual programming, I, I don't know that we would have uh, the same understanding about what's going on. Yeah, they seem to repeat CIA talking points. Uh, they would be for censoring you. <laughs> that's what that's what you no comment. That, that's what that's yeah, what you I mean, get. you know, anytime somebody's just calling somebody a genocider or a dictator is what we've come to learn. It's just a really quick way of undermining them. And that's what I would encourage them and everybody else who's gotten into the habit of using that language to consider. You know, Abiy Ahmed was a Nobel Prize winning recipient in 2019. Fast forward to November 2020, he's a genocider overnight. You got to right. ask why? Why? Isn't that <laughs> just ask I why? I would like yeah. to know why the United States doesn't like the current government of Ethiopia and why they want to put in the uh, the old one. I, 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 do you have a theory on that? I do have a theory. So this region is strategically really important. A lot of trade goes through. Okay. That's why they're obsessed with Ethiopia. It's not because they care about Ethiopia or anything else. It's just strategically very important. Um, and TPLF has been the ethno-fascist force that has kept the entire Horn of Africa divided. And when you divide people, you make war possible, you make looting resources possible, uh, you make it possible for the Imperials to take way more than their fair share. When you have somebody like Abiy Ahmed, um, literally there's a, a tripartite alliance that was created in January 2020 between him and the Eritrean government, Eritrean president, as well as the Somalian president. They don't like that so much. They don't like unity so much. Well, I know the United States likes to bomb Somalia and they also like to help. So so that's not good for them. Right. So the United States is like, whoa, we, we want to be able to bomb these people. We can't have you having an alliance. And then Yemen is right there which we also help uh, commit a genocide, actually, and you know, the United States is helping. Over 500,000 people are dead now in that war, and that's at the behest of Saudi Arabia and the petrodollar, which is going away, the petrodollar. So we'll see. Um, and the, 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 the biggest thing uh, in that area is if, if, they, if they don't keep you divided, then you can actually become self-sufficient. So Ethiopia has a lot of issues like any other country. Um, and they've been asking, we want to become more self-sufficient, which means war can't be a part of the story anymore. We need to be talking about economic development. And we want control of our security apparatus. That's the biggest thing. If TPLF is in power, the U.S. handles the security of the Horn of Africa. Ah, Africom. okay. Oh, yeah. there you go. Okay, so now it even makes more sense. Okay, yeah. All yeah. right, well, of course, and, go ahead. Of course, yeah. And, and Eritrea has been actually, like, incredibly resistant to imperialism. I would argue that they are the Cuba of Africa, and they are a bad example for everybody else in Africa because they've survived for 30-plus years resisting imperialism. Yeah, it's nice. the northern. Oh, yeah, here it see is. Eritrea. So this is the yep. country. I've never heard of this country. You're, yeah, I'm, it's I mean, it lays low, but they're very independent. You know, they, they've been sanctioned for decades and they've somehow been able to survive. And they are an example of what is possible resisting imperialism. They are the only country in that region that didn't have AFRICOM there. They are in charge of their own security. And that's you know, a bad example for Ethiopia and Somalia. Okay. All right. Wow. Well, great job, uh, Hermela uh, Aragawi, uh, in independent Ethiopian American journalist. Hashtag no more. Hashtag no Thank more. You. I would like to see you saying that, Jimmy. You've been saying no more. You just don't know that that's what you were saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I really appreciate you reaching out and coming on and sharing your story Thank about you. Ethiopia and what's actually happening. Of course, it's a it's what's it's, it's never what it seems to be. With if you're getting your news uh, about foreign uh, policy uh, from the corporate news, you're you're misinformed 100. percent So it's 100%. all it's often the exact opposite of what they're saying. 
but here we are. All right. Thank you, Amela. We'll see you next time. Stay in touch. Thank you for the platform. Really appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. We're doing live stand-up shows in Cleveland, Columbus, Pittsburgh, Des Moines, Omaha, Kansas City, Las Vegas, all over the country. Go to JimmyDoreComedy.com for a link for tickets. And single tickets now available at all venues. So if you tried to buy one before and you couldn't, single tickets are now available. Plus, while you're at JimmyDoreComedy.com, why don't you become a premium member? Sign up to our mailing list so when they cancel us, we can still stay in touch. Mm-hmm.